the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear from the words of St. John the Theologian that those who would not come to Christ, those who would not come to God, would not come to the light, lest their deeds should be exposed by the light. And we find throughout scriptures, from the Old Testament, throughout the lives of the saints, that the one who is closest to God, and as one comes closer to God, one starts to see himself more, since he comes closer to the light, and truly, his deeds are exposed by the light. Naturally, one of two things would happen. One would run away from the light, or one would come closer to the light. One would grow in pride, or one would grow in humility. The closer we come to the light, the more we see ourselves. And as St. Nikitas Stethato says, who was a disciple of St. Simeon, the new theologian, if we do not wish to heal our broken condition as human beings, we will never know ourselves. How can we know ourselves since we are far from the light? We need the light in order to see. This is why in the prayer which St. Simeon, the new theologian, says before communion, he asks, rather teach me what I should say and what I should utter. And the very first thing that St. Simeon, the new theologian, the pure God-bearer says, I have sinned more than the harlot. Under divine inspiration, since he asks our Savior, teach me what I should say. And that's what he said. Abraham, the prophet, the patriarch, when he had audience with God as all the prophets, would see their nothingness. And he said, I am dust and ashes. I am now speaking to God and I am dust and ashes. Peter, the holy apostle, when he recognized Christ through the great miracle, said, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. The centurion said, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under the roof of the house of my soul. The prodigal said, I am not worthy to be called thy son. Receive me as thy hired servant. And now the publican says, O God, be gracious to me, a sinner. We find now in this blessed time how to pray. We find a means to pray since today is the first day of the Triodion. The Triodion is the period where we prepare ourselves for great Lent. Pascha, the Feast of Pascha, is the Feast of Feasts and the Festival of Festivals as we chant on that blessed night. And so there are different levels of preparation for this great feast, since the feast is celebrated commensurate to our spiritual state. The feast is understood commensurate to our spiritual state. For we are healed, our passions are healed by the passion of Christ. We are raised up on high together with Christ, but we must also suffer with him and be crucified with him. We must pick up our cross and follow Christ. And in this, we shall find great delight and great joy. So the Triodion is a very important time. This is why, usually at this point of the year, temptations start. The demons are malicious, and they are relentless in their struggle against us. And they continuously try to sow thoughts or temptations from without, temptations from within, in many and diverse ways, to distract us from God, to distract us from the work of finding God who is in us. So. Since Pascha is such a 
important feast. We have Holy Week, which prepares us for Pascha. We have Great Lent, which prepares us for Holy Week. And we have the Triodium, which prepares us for Great Lent. This is the most important time of the year. It's Great Lent is so important that we have to have these three weeks beforehand so that we can learn how to approach Great Lent. We are not to approach Great Lent in the way of the Pharisee. We are to approach Great Lent in the manner of the publican. Throughout the service, the publican is the one who is honored because of his humility. So two men went into the temple of God to pray. The one was a Pharisee, the other was a publican. And the Pharisee started his prayer, and he was standing up. And his head was up high, his nose was up in the air. And he started his prayer by saying, I thank thee, O God. Of course, entering into the temple was a good thing. Thanking God was a good thing. But then when he starts praying, he reveals to us the position, the disposition, and the state of his soul. And it's not very good. He's justifying himself continuously. He's patting himself on the back. He's trying to praise himself in front of God, who is the only one to whom praise is due. He has become his own God. He has taken the place of God. He is, if you will, an idolater. Even though outwardly he worships God, inwardly he is self-centered. And the fathers teach us that the very root cause of our sinfulness is self-love. It's the wrong kind of love. It's the worldly love, and it's not the spiritual love. It's a stupid love, because it's not real love. It doesn't do us any good. Neither will we find peace and joy from that type of love but we will find great torment, not only in the age to come, but in this life. We torment ourselves continuously with many headaches. Why is it that we get pinched over the smallest little things? Is it not because we have self-love? And this is something which needs to break. We need to crack it so that we can actually discover real love. That is not real love. There is no love in self-love. So he says, he enumerates his virtues, which are useless virtues, since they are not covered with humility and love for God. He says that he is not like other men, which indicates that he's continuously judging people. I'm not like other men who are extortioners and who do this and who do that. I fast twice in a week. I give alms to the poor. I'm good with you, God. But the judgment is God's. The judgment is not ours. You see how we delude ourselves by being so far away from God, thinking that we know. He probably felt clear in his broken conscience. He probably felt like he was okay since he continuously patted himself on the back. He continuously tried to reassure himself that the way he was going was fine. And in the end he says, and I'm not like this publican. Very, very bad. Very impure before God. And the publican was on his knees, on the ground, with his head to the ground, looking to the ground, from whence he came from, realizing that we are made from this humble material which is trampled upon, and God takes it and makes us a man. And he says, O oh God, be gracious to me, a sinner. And he would not so much as lift up his, his eyes to look up to heaven since he understood his unworthiness. He concentrated within himself his sins. In such a state, slowly, this person will find God. The fathers teach us concerning the Jesus prayer, concerning noetic prayer, which none of us really have attained, 
because of our unworthiness and because of our lack of zeal and because of our self-love and because of many other reasons. And they say to tilt the head towards the heart. And he had his head closer to his heart and closer to the earth, as we said, from whence he was taken. So now this is the way that the fathers teach us that we must begin. It's the very first lesson that we have for our embarkation, for our beginning of this great period of Great Lent. And many of us have been coming to church for many years and hearing the same thing, but because of our pride, things are not penetrating. Things don't make sense to us. We have so many beautiful examples of repentant sinners throughout the history of the church. There was one who reposed in the early 1900s, maybe 1918, who was from one of the worst cities in Greece in terms of sinfulness, from Kalamata. His name was Elias Panavoulakis. And he was... Uh, he was a very bad man. All the evil things that the world offers, he plunged himself into. And one day he went to a funeral. And he heard in the epistle that there is, that at the time of the departure of the soul from the body, we depart from death unto life. And that one little phrase touched his heart so much that he asked, is there another life? And the person who was there present, who was a believer, expounded to him concerning the things of God, which are revealed to us by means of repentance. They become real to us because of repentance. The prayer of the Pharisee makes a person shallow, He's not capable of really delving into the deep things and the mysteries of God. So this man, Elias Panavolakis, was so touched by this. Imagine the great change of the illustrious living to going and living in a cave. He went and lived in a cave without anything. And then he started preaching to everyone, repent. Repent, because he discovered God through repentance. And this is how, as we said, we discover the Most High God. Repentance is so important that, as we said, St. Simeon the New Theologian, under divine inspiration, says, I have sinned more than the harlot. And the priests who serve the service of the divine liturgy, according to St. Simeon the New Theologian, should pray at least one hour before they serve with great compunction and remorse for their sins, he says, to make some type of appreciation for himself, but also for the people. This is something which, unfortunately, most of us do not do. And during the, the service of the Divine Liturgy, after having been prepared through the services of Vespers and Matins and all the other services of the Church, which prepare us and lead us towards the direction of the divine liturgy, which prepares us to become gods by grace. There are many prayers of compunction, penitential prayers, which are said even by a priest. For example, at the time when we chant the Shrubikim, let us who mystically represent the cherubim and chant the thrice holy hymn unto the life reigning trinity. Now lay aside all earthly care, so that we may receive the King of all, escorted invisibly by the angelic orders. At that time, there's a prayer which the priest says, where he asks the Most High God to purge his soul of an evil conscience. And he admits that no one is worthy who is entangled in this life and in carnal desires to come close to God. But because of God's mercy, because of his great compassion, he slowly cleanses the person and brings him to purity. And so what happens after this prayer is the priest senses 
And this is actually his private prayer time, if you will. It's the time when he tries to propitiate himself with repentance so that he can continue the awesome liturgy because he's coming to the heart of the divine liturgy. But many people are shallow and they don't understand that this is time given. This is such blessed time. And so traditionally, the priest starts by saying, Oh, come, let us worship and fall down before our King and God. As St. John of the Latter says, Tell your thoughts, Oh, come, let us worship and fall down before Christ our King and God. Collect them. Concentrate. And then he says the 50th Psalm, because that is the Psalm of Repentance, the Psalm of the Holy Prophet David. He's repenting. And then there are many added him, added prayers, which can be said, which are penitential prayers, which are said by many different clergy. But there are a few that are also in the book. And so after the sensing, the priest kisses the antimension. Before he kisses the antimension, he says the prayer of the prodigal. After, he says the prayer of the publican. I cry unto thee, O Lord, with the voice of the publican, be thou gracious unto me as thou hast unto him, and have mercy on me, O God. I have sinned against thee, O Lord, as did the prodigal son receive me. As one repentant, and have mercy on me, O God. These are the prayers which are said. For what purpose? Because light comes to us by means of repentance. Repentance is not forced, especially if a person comes close to God and is close to the light. How could it be forced when he sees what he's made of? When he sees how much correction needs to be made? When he sees the state of our fallen human nature? And slowly he understands that he must come back to his ancient beauty before the fall. But what is, what is one of the central themes and passions of the Pharisee connected with his self-love? His self-justification. For in this we find that we were banished from paradise. Many people don't understand this. <laughs> they think that we are banished from paradise just because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve, but not so. There was more to it than that. God gave them a chance. But because of the spiritual death which came to Adam and Eve, <laughs> they were too dark. Because they listened to the voice of the serpent, who is venomous, they were darkened. And what communion hath light with darkness? And the Lord says, Adam, where are you? And Adam was ashamed because he sinned. He was naked of the grace of God. And our Lord gives him time. And our Lord tries to apply the therapeutic medicine by also speaking to Adam and Eve, giving them a chance and all they did was justify themselves. They didn't say sorry. They didn't say we've sinned. Eve blamed the serpent. Adam blamed Eve. And on top of it, he said, the woman who you gave me. And when people are darkened and they don't understand the circumstances of life and how God's providence works in our lives, they can come to the point where they blame God. And you can be sure that at that point, the person is in deep darkness. It's God's fault, they think. And there is no responsibility on our part. Well, we have to follow the example of the publican, and we shall see, and we shall be able to understand these things, and we shall be able to understand that it is not God's fault, that it is the sin which is rooted in us, which needs to be expelled, and it won't be expelled overnight. So we should be very cautious about self-justification 
because our Lord stresses that the public, the, the Pharisee who was trying to justify himself in prayer was left unjustified, and the publican who, who was speechless, who had nothing to say, left the temple justified. Same thing happens in our daily lives. With humility, we can justify ourselves so easily. And yet we tire ourselves out and we tire the other people out when we're always justifying ourselves, especially when we are unjustifiable. So we learn today that we must repent. And the period of Great Lent is, par excellence, the, the period of repentance. For how else can we receive the Lord who is resurrected and who ascended and send down the grace of the All Holy Spirit? In this do we find God, as we said. In this can we understand the feasts of the Church. In this can we be one with God. In this do we show that we are Christians, and in this will we find the great pearl, the pearl of great price, which is hidden within us. <clears throat> so, as the priest who is supposed to be the mediator between the people and God at the time of the divine liturgy repents, we should also repent together with him. For he prays, as it says in the prayers, Iperton imeteron amartimaton, for our own sins and for the ignorances of the people. Oh, how much ignorance there is. How much ignorance there is. As we keep saying, we're missing out, my beloved Orthodox Christians. And the further away we are from the light, the more ignorant we are. Don't think that you know it all. We don't know it all. We're very far from knowledge. Since, as the Holy Apostle Paul says, the things of God are so deep, how can we even express them? There's no end to them, at least if we can scratch the surface. At least if we can scratch the surface by means of repentance and humility, we will be able to discover that those things which are the most important things for us. We will start to work for our salvation and we will start, as we said last week, to offer fruits worthy of repentance. We will struggle with diligence, with joyfulness, with thanksgiving for the tools which the Lord gives us in order to repent. And fasting is one of those tools. Repentance. Repentance has many fruits. Fasting is one of them, of course, prayer is the other one, prostrations, and so on and so forth. We can find our God by many ways. We need to offer zeal to Him, and we should pray to Him to give us the zeal to be true Christians. As St. Isaac the Syrian says, pray to the Lord that He will enlighten you, that He will send to you the same fire which He sent to the apostles and to the martyrs and to the fathers. And this is the fire which does not consume and certainly we should pray that we not get burned by this fire, but it illuminates us. It enlivens us. It gives us hope. It gives us understanding. Let us today pray the prayer of the publican. O oh God, be gracious unto me, sinner. And let us learn the power of the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me since essentially it's the same idea, it's the prayer of repentance. And if we persist, we will receive illumination. Be very careful with the thought of giving up, because sometimes people get discouraged because they think that they're not changing. And this is a trick of the devil. The Lord is testing your faith and your patience. And the Lord is not a liar. He says, ask and you shall receive. And so we must persist. And if we think that nothing is changing, that persistent prayer is so well pleasing to God. And there will come a time when the Lord will lift those things which bar us 
and which are obstacles in the way between us and God. <laughs> with humility, our hearts will be open to the Most High God. With repentance, we will find that the Holy Spirit has his abode deeply within the soul of the Orthodox Christian. Let us honor and worship our one God and Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And let us pray that he deem us worthy to embark upon this most blessed path of the Triodion and Great Lent, leading us to the resurrection here and in the age to come. Amen.